welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists... But of course you have to understand in this part of the world, it's not a matter of how many cows you have per acre, it's how many acres you have per cow. So not quite, but pretty close to that, I'm afraid. So uh, size definitely matters. And I guess that your whole career is about being making things bigger. Uh, making ways. small things bigger. Making small <laughs> things bigger, that's right. Welcome to the Microscopists. In today's episode, I stepped into a brief history of how the confocal microscopy came to be with one of its pioneers, Tony Wilson from the University of Oxford. Wearing his cowboy hat and boots throughout most of the interview, Tony talked about his passion for cattle, his Jaguar, and Yorkshire cricket, and how finding life scientists to this new technique was not as simple as you may now think. Hello, I'm Peter O'Toole, and today in the Microscopist, I'm joined with Tony Wilson. Uh, hi, Tony. Hi, Peter. Uh, I don't know if you if you remember even, but actually the very first contact I had, obviously I knew who you were. But the very first contact I had with you was a letter through the post inviting me to be a member of the light microscopy uh, section at the Royal Microscopical Society. <laughs> and if we, if we weren't still in lockdown, I still have it in my office, that letter. Good grief. That's a long time ago, Pete. That, that must be 20 years ago? No, less. No, it must be. Yeah, no, definitely less. Yeah. <laughs> Not that old Tony. <laughs> Sadly, I have... Um, White hair. Yeah, yeah, so do I if I go sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be sat here a lot today looking like that, so just to, just to hide that silver sheen within it. So well, no, I, I, I remember had... that. Uh, mm. And I remember my first meeting and meeting, you know, I, I wasn't nearly as confident. I was feeling a bit out of water, really, uh, <laughs> when I came in. And you made it really welcoming at the time. Well, that's uh, very kind of you to say so. You're, obviously, I knew of you. Your reputation uh, precedes you. Obviously, was one of the pioneers of the confocal microscope. And um, we'll come to that in a little bit. But I quickly found out you're not all that serious. And uh, <laughs> I, I, someone pointed out, he goes, oh, yeah, just get Tony ask, talking about cowboys. And uh, <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought, what is this about? So, Tony, I, I do believe that you're quite fond of your, certainly your cowboy boots. My cowboy your, uh, boots right now. I'm afraid you can't see because um, of where, well, actually you can sort of see in that um, I took the precaution of having one here for you to see, but I'm not actually wearing it, but you can see the, uh, the heel and the um, yeah. echt part of the cowboy boot. And I guess I have to complete the, uh, the whole thing with the hat. Um, I, but it's a bit more than just the sort of um, urban cowboy. I'm actually, quite interested in the cattle industry and I'm actually speaking to you f from Texas uh, where I am stuck in the lockdown and um, I got interested in this basically because of my father-in-law and um, we have a place a few well it's about a hundred miles to the south of here uh, near a place yeah. called uh, Waco um, where we raise um, Santa Gertrudis cattle. Uh, and that's a cattle breed that was pr pretty much invented in Texas for Texas at a thing called the King Ranch. And it's a cross which is hopefully able to uh, survive the Texas high summers, uh, which are pretty hot and certainly in the s south where the King Ranch is, unlike here, it's very humid, but you know, temperatures of 100 old fashioned Fahrenheit degrees are not uncommon for quite a long time. Uh, and th these animals. Um, Tony, that, that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, yes? Fahrenheit, old money, yeah. Uh, hot, yes. 30 odd in your money. Um, and that's pretty unpleasant. And the King Ranch. Uh, invented this breed and uh, we have a whole bunch of them. The 
King Ranch, I might say, by way of just il um, illustration that in Texas, p p people will like things to be big. I mean, there's the unfortunate j joke of the person from Alaska who said, you know, if we chopped Alaska in half, you'd be the third largest state, which is true, but slightly unkind. <laughs> um, the King Ranch, however, at the height of its... Um, properties was huge in area and actually the King Ranch properties if you include their uh, properties in Australia where the Santa Gertrudis is a big breed if you include that then the King Ranch was larger in area privately owned I might say than the state of Rhode Island so it's big uh, it sounds yeah, uncomprehensively big, actually. It's quite hard yes. to get your head around the size that we're talking about. It is. But, you, of course, you have to understand in this part of the world, it's not a matter of how many cows you have per acre. It's how many acres you have per cow. So not quite, but pretty close to that, I'm afraid. So uh, size definitely matters. And I guess that your whole career is about being making things bigger. <laughs> making small ways. things bigger. Making <laughs> small things bigger. That's right. <laughs> exactly so, exactly so. Uh, so, Andrew, so thinking about it, your impacts, certainly in the world of biology, have been profound. Uh, and many Nobel laureates have only been able to get to that position thanks to the emergence and development of confocal microscopy, for which you were very much behind the development and commercialization of that. So, mm -hmm. how, how did that all start? It started by accident and it also started by going up the wrong path and it's probably worth pointing out why we went up the the wrong path. Um, this is going back to the early 1970s and the thought, actually a thought not had by me, but a thought had by a brilliant man called Rudy Kompfner who was an Austrian man who actually was an Austrian. He ended up in the UK during the war. He was a radio amateur. He was actually an architect by profession and he um, ended up in the UK. And as I, I say, he was um, a radio amateur and he invented of his own volition a thing which became known as the traveling wave tube. And this was a way in which you could amplify uh, microwaves. It turned out to be the, the key thing that made radar work as I understand it and the story that I heard was that he had this idea and he r wrote it up and being an amateur he sent the thing to a magazine called Wireless World which at that stage and indeed when I was a child maybe even now for all I know you could buy in news agents and the impressive part of the story is that someone at Wireless World realized this was a very good idea and not only that that they couldn't publish it so he was he yanked out of internment and i think shipped off to birmingham university to work with either randall or boot i can't remember who the in inventors of the uh Klystron, and the traveling wave tube became very important he ended up in bell labs after the war and when he retired from Bell Labs, he took two jobs being a clever man. He decided to spend the English winters in California, in Stanford, and the English summers in Oxford. And the work that he set up in Stanford was the scanning acoustic microscope, t taking the view that actually all the optical microscope can do is look at variations in refractive index and frankly who cares about refractive index whereas the acoustics I, I, I like that these days I mean <laughs> <laughs> this was 30 years ago a bit more uh, and so he thought quite rightly that um, the acoustic microscope which really gives contrast because of the stiffness the strength the mechanical properties of the material it will be much more interesting he was right in that but of course the acoustic microscope never really took off in oxford we were doing the optical microscope what were we trying to do the idea was that most biological tissue is pretty much transparent uh, at that time we didn't really know why you guys use fluorescent 
labels. And we thought it was, and we were wrong, we thought it was because there wasn't enough contrast in the regular microscope image. So the idea was, why can't you do good contrast? Well, the, the reason is because you're trying to do it optically. And optically, if you have a big signal with a small background, it's very hard to see the small background. There are techniques, but it's hard. In electronics, if you've got a small signal on a weak background, it's trivially easy to get rid of the large background and amplify up the small wiggles. So in order to do that, you need the signal to be an electronic signal. Now remember in those far gone days, there were no such things as CCD cameras. So we had to somehow get the image electronically. Remember also back in 19, the 70s, the laser had just about become a commercial viability. Not the kind of things we have now, but you could get lasers at a reasonable price, pretty much the helium neon laser. Uh, and so we had a bright light bulb. And so the idea was to build on earlier work of the flying spot microscope, where the flying spot was actually a television screen that was D. Uh, so the spot would scan across the TV screen, you would demagnify it onto the specimen, that would be your flying spot illumination, and you would have a photomultiplier tube to pick up the scan signal. So we had a laser which we scanned across the specimen, and then we had a photomultiplier tube and we built up the image point by point as we scanned across the image, on a long persistence television screen. So there was so no capture. If, if we hadn't got photomultiply tubes, or no, if, go back one, if we had CCDs when yep. you started off, would yep. you have even thought of going to the point source and PMTs, or would you have gone to try and using wide film CCDs? So uh, I suppose actually that's a very good question because we started off, once we'd built the thing, of course, we have, I have this, I don't, can't quite think of the word, but a wish to write down a mathematical model. And the mathematical model is actually, it's sort of easier if it's scanning, although I have to say, if it's scanning with a large detector, it's exactly the same mathematics as the uh, regular wide field microscope, but you sort of think differently in the scanning thing. You th think about the source and the detector in a way that you might not think ab ab about it in the um, regular microscope. So mathematically, without getting very boring, you start off with a source and you propagate the light through the specimen to the detector. And if the detector is big, without going into too much uh, boring stuff, you have to do an integral over the whole of the optical uh, intensity that arrives at the detector. And again, integrals are hard work. If you stick a pinhole, a point, at the detector, you don't have to do the integral. Now, when we started off building these things, we knew nothing about optics. So we thought, how can we build a simple system? And we thought it would be easier because we didn't know much about optics. We felt fairly confident we could take a spot of light and focus it to a point. That after all is what objectives are supposed to, to, to do. And then we could, have the objective re-image that point onto the specimen. That way we thought the uh, optics would behave well. Which that involved us having to scan the specimen in order to get the whole um, object. And that thing behind you is the very first specimen scanning stage, thank you, that we built. It didn't last very long. How did it work? There are two loudspeaker coils behind you, voice coils, which push the thing marked flexible legs. And the idea was that the specimen would sit on that stage, the voice coils would push like this, and the specimen would scan. 
And this scanner, which was actually designed by this man, Rudy Confner, that's his drawing, this lasted a few minutes, maybe 10, because of a thing we then learned called metal fatigue. So this thing fell to pieces and we had to build a better one. This worked, I might say, remarkably well, but of course was not convenient for imaging any specimen which was not pretty small. And it, it also, and we also scanned the thing vertically, which for biology, biology, by the way, doesn't seem to work vertically. Biology wants to be, be nice and flat and calm, and I don't blame it. Uh, I like to be nice and flat and calm too. <laughs> Uh, so we, we then m m moved on to a stage scanner that was horizontal and then it became obvious when we'd learned a bit more optics, well actually you really do have to scan the beam, obviously you do. So from, from that stage you've got the, the basics of a confocal microscope, you see the potential and, and there's huge potential, Ob obviously we know what the potential is now, we realise that potential to a great degree. Mm. How easy was it to take the idea, you've got a scanning microscope that works, how easy was it to get a biologist to actually use it and to, to, to become widely accepted as it is today? It was hard uh, and I don't blame the biologist also. We had one, I had a very good friend in Oxford, um, Tom Cunane, who <laughs> was a person who loved technology. Uh, the com he really did. And the system that we had didn't, wasn't conducive to biology. I mean, one trivial way, um, it, in Oxford where this was going on, there is a science area where all the departments are pretty close to each other in reality. The engineering science department isn't actually in the science area. It's pretty close. It's a two, three, four, five minute walk but it involves a four or five minute walk and it involves crossing a road. And biologists didn't like crossing the road uh, and biology in particular didn't like crossing the road, still didn't until the last few years when we started doing experiments with um, C. elegans and so on. Finally, we got those things to cross the road and I might say talking about biology w wanting to be, be nice and calm these C. elegans came and the um, donor of these things said look at them in this uh, petri dish they are quote grazing on a lawn of bacteria well my goodness grazing on a lawn of bacteria across Parks Road was not an easy thing <laughs> uh, and so it was hard for them to get the biology to us. Yep. Our stage scanner wasn't conducive to biology, if I'm completely honest. Although later on, we were able to do what I think was really quite re re remarkable things with the stage scanner. But it was fighting the technology. It was also new, which meant to say it didn't work every time. It was also new right at the beginning, before the um, uh, image capture software, in that we had a long persistence television screen. So the scanning wasn't fast, the scanning wasn't real time. You had to turn the lights out in the lab. So it was a relatively painful way to get the specimen. And I, I, I really don't blame the biologist for not cottoning on to what we were trying to do because it was hard and the, the biologists perfectly reasonably their main interest was biology uh, and we couldn't provide them with the wow image or the ability to see biological processes or to see cell division to watch it happening to do 3d reconstruction because we weren't at that stage yet and I think it must be quite frustrating to, to know what you can do and the, the technology still needing to be developed. The idea is there. It's done. Yeah. To actually develop it into something that it becomes functional. So a biologist, it's useful to them. It that must be, be quite a tall order. It's a tall order and you, you do it in stages. And we've been incredibly lucky that parallel technologies have developed along with the confocal. 
I don't think we could have actually built a better system, even if we'd had Genelia farm type funding in 1970s than we did. The lasers weren't there. The image capture wasn't there. Image processing wasn't there. So that couldn't have happened. So I think we did what we could. And, and also, to be honest, we were starting off, we were aiming, aiming it at the semiconductor industry. Because what, what were we actually doing? If you, if you strip out the, the application, we were adding a third dimension of resolution to the optical microscope. The optical microscope can do, never mind arguing, it can do well in X and Y. It can measure dimensions in X and Y. It's hopeless in Z. It's hopeless measuring dimensions. I mean, I'm waving hands in, in this. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hopeless in Z. So what we were trying to do was to introduce resolution in the Z direction. So you could then measure things in X, Y, and Z. You could measure volume, for instance. And so the idea was we could do critical dimension metrology, which in the semiconductor industry, X and Y are critical. Z is even is equally critical. If Z's not right, the device won't work. So it was adding um, extra um, functionality to the conventional microscope to provide this Z resolution. Did we, as simple engineering scientists, know anything about biology? No. Did we realize that you could see these uh, processes as the cell underwent mitosis? We'd never heard of the word mitosis. Of course we didn't know. And I, I think, yeah, you, you're right, so I think the biologist wasn't demanding this either, because I don't think, because it ha wasn't available, they weren't needing it. Yeah. They, no, so you've also got an un untapped market. So it's not until yeah. they become aware of what it's capable of, because suddenly they want everything. And if you ask people now, they want even more and more and more. Of and, course. And it really snowball. Now they got past the first hurdle, which was the convo, yeah. which really pushed them on. Okay, just take you back a bit now, right from the start. You've made this massive impact. Where did you start though? What, what was your undergraduate in to start with? My undergraduate degree was in Oxford in engineering science. And that I think was a very, very good foundation then. And it was a course where you, you had options. You had options in the final year. And they were options of a kind that no one has these days. There, so, so in year one and year two, you had no choice whatsoever. You did everything. In year three, you did everything for, I honestly can't remember, let's say for half the year. I really don't remember. And then if you wished, you could take an optional paper. And I, I again, I don't remember, but because it was engineering science, let's just make it up and say you could take an optional paper in electrical subjects, mechanical subjects, civil subjects, um, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, can't remember, that was, pro oh, that was probably it. And you could do an optional project if you so wished. And then you could submit this optional project as part of your final marks. You could do the same thing with the optional uh, paper. But it was optional, which meant you could do it or not as you wished. If you didn't do it, that was fine. If you did the optional paper and you did badly, it was ignored. If you did well, it took out, it took, you know, it, it helped. So you had nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. So what it meant was you learned a, a lot, actually, about a lot. So I think that led, that helped tremendously because one of the things, as I said, we had this um, voice coil, this loudspeaker to do the scanning. But we had the background to, to we actually sat down and said, well, look, can't we design a better loudspeaker? It's an electromechanical device. We know all about MMFs. We know all about um, Ampere's law. Surely we can build for our purposes 
the whole thing and we can build a scanner into it as well so we can have electromagnetic coils the thing which normal the thing going in and out would actually have the specimen on it we could have two uh, or four of these magnetic uh, circuits and we could control the scanner we could scan it in x and y we could scan it in a lissajou figure we could do all of these things which if we hadn't had this broad background i don't think we'd have come anywhere near so i'm noticing the book in your background actually which i think says electricity and magnetism so it does no, that doesn't date back to that that time. Uh, the book does that version does not. <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 followed after that? Because you know, for your microscopy, uh, I bet you at the under through your undergraduate, I bet you didn't even think about a microscope. Didn't think about it at all. I mean, I started off my PhD or rather D Phil, if I'm if I give the Oxford words, working on the subject of integrated optics the whole idea being optical fibers were beginning to be the way forward in optical communications and the whole idea of optical signal processing was important and one of the ways that you could do that was via this technique of integrated optics where the optical signal would travel along an optical waveguide in an optical circuit you would have various um filters or sw sw switches couplers that you would build into this um, optical substrate these were electro optic materials and you could switch um, light to go in one direction or the other that was what I started off working on uh, and that was very much flavor of the month around the world um, but we didn't have the, or we didn't, my supervisor didn't have the f funding for that. At that time, this chap, Rudy Konfner, was a visitor in the department. As I said, he spent the summers in Oxford. And pretty much by the time it became clear this initial project was not going to be able to lead anywhere because we couldn't do any experiments, was let us imagine around easter which was around the time he was floating through and um i got interested in what he had to offer and so i switched projects at about easter of my first year and worked on this for some time then um got interested in some other bits of nonlinear optics and played about with that for a bit. Then spent some time in Bell Labs in the United States where I worked on bistable liquid crystal displays. The, the idea being you write whatever it is you're interested in um, in the display, t turn off the signal and the thing stays written. The, B B Bell were obviously interested in that for the phone systems. And, and so, so when you, that's quite a big switch. You're in Oxford for quite some years and then you switched over to it. So how did you find moving over to America? And oh, it was a, it, challenges. Bell Labs at that time was coming towards the end of being the great Bell Labs. That's to, to say it was the time of the antitrust uh, suit, which in the end ended up with Judge green splitting up the um well just very qu quickly um at and um the bell labs was partly owned by at and t and partly owned by western electric the problem being at and t owned both western electric and the bell operating companies uh, but being in bell labs was fantastic um the people there were incredibly good uh, remember this was quite a long time ago and if you wanted a paper uh, to read you just picked up the t telephone spoke to a tape recorder and the next morning or shortly thereafter a photocopy was on your desk uh, it was the only time where the mantra spend money to save time was the way you did i mean right now in a university you wouldn't dream of well, you would dream of it, yeah. <laughs> possibly do it. You'd certainly dream of it. <laughs> so uh, that, was, uh, that was a real eye-opener. But by the way, I'm not sure that throwing money at it was really the right 
way, but um, was a pleasant thing to do. So, and, and what about living in America itself, outside of work? How was that for you? Ah, I w- was lucky. Um, the Bell, well, Bell Labs began life in Manhattan, and then Bell Labs moved out to New J- Jersey. And I worked at a Bell Labs place called Homedale, that there were really two big ones. Uh, Murray Hill was the original one, then Homedale was an offshoot, and an offshoot of Homedale was a place called Crawford Hill, which is just a few, well, it's probably about a mile away, and that's where the first um, s- satellite thing uh, went from. But I was lucky for the first time in my life to live on a beach. Well, not, not, not actually on the, the beach, but within about 50 meters of the beach, and that afforded two things one in the winter it was extraordinarily cold and my car would freeze up I mean it really was very cold but from this beach I remember lying in the water having um, gone down and lying on my back and looking through my feet and through my feet I could see the Verrazzano narrows bridge and behind that the world trade center and i thought this is not a bad view really <laughs> this was pretty nice so that's the second time i just noticed you're now lying down you semi beach bum at this point absolutely Later on you understand biology because you like to you probably prefer to lie down and just relax there is a <laughs> coming out here tony <laughs> of course, are you a night owl uh, are you an early bird or are you I don't want either I just just, just a midday person <laughs> no I prefer the early mornings I don't like late nights particularly I mean I do them from time to time the idea of burning the midnight oil I don't like I much prefer to get up early so I also know you've got a passion for crossword uh, crosswords cryptic crossword I'm, I'm afraid so yeah yeah I'm afraid and so so that that arrives on your desktop at six o'clock is it at the moment it arrives at midnight in the uk that's to say i i have a subscription so um to be perfectly honest i do what is probably the easiest of the cryptics i won't say which there's no one. such thing as an easy <laughs> crossword i still just do not get them at all there is such a thing as a really hard cryptic <laughs> crossword though. And, and so when I'm here in Texas, um, six, it depends on the time of year, but right now we're six hours uh, uh, behind you. So 6 a.m. here is midnight in the UK. So I do tend to download the crossword in the uh, evening and have a play about with it. And um for reasons you will understand, you play around with a crossword and you can't do it. You then go and do something else, which in my case is uh, going to bed. And then you wake up in the morning and suddenly number three down is easy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's come to, come to you in the dream, yes, but otherwise... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's still a mystery. When I, go to, I just keep you awake at night trying to think about why I can't understand it. Well, sadly, that puts me to sleep. <laughs> So what, what else do you do to pass your time? Uh, do you watch TV? Do you, what do you prefer, TV or book? Book because of, I th- it's a trite thing. Book because the pictures are better. I mean, I've just, the trouble with a book though is you can't put the thing down. Uh, I mean, I just started reading, I, I have to confess to you, I'd never read Whiskey Galore, the Compton McKenzie thing set in his fictional Hebridean island. Uh, until the last couple of days and the problem is once you start to read this thing I mean it's a hilariously well written uh, thing it's like something you get your teeth into you don't really want to put the thing down so I'm I I sort of um coffee then don't you you need coffee, which I'm afraid I don't have at the minute. I don't have. Many, but, uh, the, the, you say, what do I love? What did I miss about being in the states? What do I miss about being in the states? And the answer is three things, which have improved a bit. The three things that I miss when I lived in New Jersey was one bread, two cheese, and the other one was espresso, which I see you are well stocked with. <laughs> 
and uh, I'm uh, things have improved a lot. Certainly down where our ranches, th things improved tremendously when George Bush J Jr. was president. His ranches in the neighbouring county, and uh, w whether it was the visiting press pack or whatever, but the coffee locally improved tremendously. So, so that was good. Yeah, I, I, I've got to say, I, I, I do like my coffee in a big way. Yeah. And I also like TV, to be honest, but I tend to watch old things like um, old Sherlock Holmes things, old issues. This is a really embarrassing thing. Old episodes of Columbo, for example. I, I'm a big Columbo fan. But that's, that's like a, a cryptic crossword, isn't it? Well, there probably is an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm never sure you can really work it out with what's given to you along the way. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> it's always a very good summary, though. To the yes. art of an abstract. I should go to that. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> so, so, actually, what are you driving? I know in the UK, uh, you, you love your car. Yeah. In a big way. Yeah. Uh, so, actually, I think I have. There you go. Yes, that's right. I believe that's uh, maybe not your precise one. It's not actually my car because I would try, and because I wasn't expecting to be here in Texas as long as I am. Am uh, I haven't got a picture of my car, but that's basically what the thing looks like. It's that colour and that same model. And um, I've been lucky enough to have Jaguars since. Well, my, that's a picture of the in, inside. And amazingly, this picture I managed to find on the web has also got the sort of gin and gin and tonic holder open, which um, would never happen in my own car, of course. Uh, and so they're just beautiful cars. There's no two ways of, about it. And um, so, what age is it? Which which year? Because it's an XJ. Oh, this one. Uh, this one's quite old. I've had this one for a while. This one's two thousand, I think. I may be wrong on that. Um, so it is like, one of the first XJ8. That was the first series yeah. of XJ8, I think, wasn't it? You know more about this that, than I do. It to to me, it's a nice blue car. Um, uh, unlike many of these things, the I don't want to be rude about modern cars, but they, they're not often as elegant as the older ones. Some are, I completely agree, but um, I like the shape of uh, this car. It's a beautiful thing to drive. Downside, you have, it hasn't got sat nav, so I have my own sat nav, which is fine. And with the sat nav, you can learn any language you like. You just t tune in and, um, you end up learning the Latvian for bare left and so on, which I can't remember. And um, so they're interesting things. So, so what was your first car? My first car was a car which I inherited from my father. It was a Ford Cortina. And it was a very nice car, but it cost me a lot of money in the sense that... Well, but, and I learned one thing i learned from the um traffic warden i learned what operating a vehicle meant uh because the thing the problem with the ford cortina at that time was that oh there was a technique i think it was called under sealing where you had your car under sealed such that the car wouldn't uh rot from the underneath well what happened with the ford cortina of that generation was as uh water and yuck were splashed up um, from the front wheels in particular, it could cause the um, front wheel, the bit at the top of the front wheel to yeah. uh, rust through. So this car was of a considerable age and the front wheels had uh, rusted through and the traffic warden determined that I was, quote, operating a vehicle in an unfit state. And I said, look, you've given me this t t ticket at three o'clock in the morning. I wasn't operating anything. I learned then that operating meant have the ability to operate should you so wish. So there, shortly thereafter, I got rid of the Ford Cortina and replaced it, of course, with a Jaguar. You said it was costly, but is it a 3.2 or 4 litre? Uh, oh, this is 3.2. Yeah. Uh, the, the earlier one was um, 4 litre. Yeah, and you know the petrol prices back in the UK. 
that must be costing you more than it would cost to repair your Cortina. <laughs> it is cheaper by far to go everywhere by Uber, obviously. Uh, but it's not so much fun. <laughs> you do have to close your eyes a little bit when you fill up the uh, the gas. But even I even do that here now. I mean, when I lived in New Jersey, uh, petrol in this country was just on one dollar per gallon in Texas, where taxes are lower. In fact, there's no state income tax. For example, uh, petrol gas was under a dollar per gallon that's no longer true but um you're right uh quoting the price per liter makes people like me not understand how much how expensive it is until you actually come to pay the bill but yeah you're right <laughs> Right. Okay. Price per Painful. gallon. Okay. Painful. <laughs> I love the fact in the UK we buy it in litres and yet our car quotes it in miles per gallon still. Yeah, that, well, there you are. <laughs> Things we, we understand. We, are, <laughs> we sit on the fence with everything, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, bringing it back, you then came back to the UK. Uh, yeah. You had the confocal uh, ideas yeah. and it became much more widely accepted, I think, in the publication. Was it uh, Amos and White? Publication? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, the one I think which got biologists interested. That's what we want to be able to do. Yeah. So how to get it to market? Uh, you, you got that, I guess, through the Biorad and the MRC series. Uh, yeah, we, we went to market early. We went to market at the wrong time for, for, for anyone who's thinking of it. Um, we went to market... Well, we went to market just as I went to the States and we went to market because a lot of people, I have to say not biologists, were mainly in the semiconductor area. We had another technique which I won't bother to go into which we called um, OBIC which allowed us to probe properties of semiconducting materials. Um, actually look at the way they behaved in a way which gave back information about minority carrier lifetime uh, and so on and also purity of the material whether it would uh, but um, so that was of, of interest to the semiconductor people yep. and we set up a company Oxford Opto Electronics to basically sell this and we sold a few we sold the f first one which actually was confocal although probably not very good at being con confocal to texas instruments and then we also built instruments for for, for ibm and a bunch of other p p people but not really in the bio area then the amos and white paper came out and we of course thought well yeah obviously you could do that but of course we didn't know because we weren't biologists that being able to obviously do that opened a whole load of biology where people had said well at least as i understand it we believe this is what happens and you could now see yes this actually is what happens and um you could see things a lot more in parallel to them coming out with that uh frame grabber cars were becoming uh, available one was able to scan quickly maybe not quite real time but still pretty fast in parallel with that image processing had come leaps and, and bounds image processing in the 70s just wasn't there you couldn't couldn't do it and i think that's a parallel which goes on until now the video games market has made microscope imaging stuff beautiful in a way that if there'd been no video games market no one would have put it in no. and so you can now do inexpensively things which would have cost well which would have been prohibitive in the, the past so i think it's this wonderful thing of parallel technologies improving the laser improved we started off one of the first projects we had way back was harmonic generation microscopy second harmonic third yeah. harmonic uh because again that was probing the actual properties of the device but the only laser we had which this chap rudy confner was able to borrow a homemade version from bell labs we had a neodymium yag laser this is a uh infrared laser its power was one watt 
it was a CW laser, a laser that the health and safety people would not allow us to go anywhere near in the lab now. And we were able to get third, um, second harmonic um, images. We were able to melt materials very easily, but we were able to get harmonic images. A few years ago in the lab, because of the tremendous developments in laser technology, we were able to do third harmonic generation, which is a parametric process, so you're not dumping energy into the device. We were able to get um, third harmonic generation of living uh, C. elegans uh, nematode wiggly worms. Uh, and it's living. Uh, and you can see this. You can also see living embryos. Uh, technology which you couldn't dream of 30 uh, years ago, but the parallel developments of other technologies made a big difference. So you had these ideas, you took them to companies, different companies ran with elements of those ideas. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's quite, you've got your academic, how do you balance your academic side and your commercial side? I know now that there's Aurox, which is really yeah. pushing forward and developing uh, lots of new products. Yeah. That must take a lot of time and energy along with the academic side. So how it do you plan to blend it? does. Those? I mean, uh, when we first set up Oxford up to Electronics Limited, and after a while of trying to do everything uh, ourselves, and um, we then got into bed with the a company called... Um, Dubilius Scientific, which became Laser Sharp, which became Biorad, which yeah. became Biorad, uh, which, uh, yeah, um, I may have got those in slightly the wrong order. Um, when we were doing all that, university spin outs, to use the present words, were not popular. And indeed, I'm not sure they were strictly approved of. And we, we, we didn't keep it secret that we were doing that, but we didn't make a big de deal out of it. When we came to set up Aurox, uh, by that time spin-outs were more useful. And we set up Aurox actually, oh, I was about to say earlier on, I said, you know, when we set up Oxford Optoelectronics, maybe it was a mistake. And what I mean by that is, we set up a company to sell a confocal microscope when no one had heard of a confocal microscope. So much of the time we spent doing what um, one of my colleagues calls missionary work. And so you're, you're spending all your time telling people what a confocal microscope is, why it might be a good idea. Uh, and of course you have a product that doesn't quite fill those requirements because we were still at that point stage scanning. Then, uh, other people came along, uh, uh, the Brad Amos and uh, John White thing was a very good example of how you could turn these ideas into a biologically friendly form. And that was clearly the way to go. Biorad saw that and that's the way they went forward and that was, was obvious. But we had, I'm not taking cr credit for this, but if you're doing the... the um, missionary work, you're doing everybody a favour apart from yourself necessarily. Uh, is then, that not your academic side anyway? Because that, yeah, I guess your spin-out is your academic side. That's right. And the academic side, as I was saying at that point, technology, you start off by saying, well, why did you do confocal the way that you did? And the answer is because you had to. You had to have the point source. You had to have the scanner. You couldn't do it any other way. You know, an ordinary light bulb isn't sufficiently bright. You can't scan it around. But of course, as all this was going on, technology was improving. Lasers were improving. They were becoming semiconductor. They were available over a wide variety of wavelengths. Also the CCD camera had improved leaps and, and bounds, partly because um, I got, I mean one of the wonderful things about being an academic is you get invited to conferences all over the place and oh, 20 years ago or so the scientific CCD for 
um, astronomy or for spectroscopy was becoming very important. And I was luckily, lucky enough to be invited to a number of conferences, in essence aimed at imaging where the light levels are very low. So it was a meeting of people who were doing imaging combined with people who were trying to detect incredibly weak mm. signals. And this was run by a spectroscopist, actually a spectroscopist from East Texas, and he ran these meetings in the Cayman Islands in December. So that was about as much of an impact, as much of a come on to get interested in low imaging in low light levels. That introduced me to the CCD camera in anger. And also introduced me, told me pretty clearly that the days of wet, pho of wet photography were over. Of the companies who were there, the one that sticks in mind was Kodak. And I thought, if Kodak are getting interested in this, this is going to be the way forward. So the CCD camera came along, which could detect weaker signals. So you say to yourself, well, what is it you want your microscope to do? And the answer is you want it to do everything the regular microscope can do without any doubt. You don't want to throw any of that away, but you want it to have this axial resolution. So the question is, let's start from scratch. Let's say, okay, we've got the conventional microscope. We can get the image electronically now trivially easily. You just stick a CCD camera there. There's no need to scan, but you still have to get the thing to give you the three-dimensional imaging. How on earth can you do that? Which is where you've been heading more All recently. along, really. Uh, it was where we're heading recently. So, Plan A was to use structured illumination. Because you like to do the mathematics, it turns out that if you do build a confocal, again, I won't go into fine detail, you illuminate the specimen with light from a point source. Mathematically, a point source, if you think of it in terms of spatial frequencies, contains all spatial frequencies. So you illuminate the specimen with all possible spatial frequencies. If you have a point detector, you detect it with all possible spatial frequencies. If you have a conventional microscope, you have a planar detector that's got one spatial frequency. So with a conventional microscope, you detect one spatial frequency. With the conventional, you detect all of them. And with the conventional, not only do you detect all of them, you actually detect an average over all of them. If it's an average, it can't be the best. So the thought, therefore, is yeah. let's, not let's not illuminate with all spatial frequencies, that means all angles, but let's illuminate with one. And let's pick that one, do the mathematics, such that it enhances the confocal effect. It gives you the optical sectioning. So the idea was... Let's illuminate with a single spatial frequency. That means a single sinusoidal pattern. Yeah. And let's look at the image that we get. And what you get, because you have to image, you can't image with a single sinusoidal pattern because you can't have negative light. So you have to have a background with this pattern superimposed. So what you get when you look with your eye is you get a conventional image due to the background yep. superimposed upon which is the confocal image but modulated with this fringe pattern so then you say to yourself okay i can in the computer i can get rid of the background that's relatively easy and so what i then get is the image i want but it's modulated plus minus by this fringe pattern how do I get rid of that? Well, you get rid of that by taking more than one image and you play abracadabra in the computer and you get out an image. Sounds so magic. that's right. So we then thought, okay, we will uh, license the patent on this. So we license the patent and there's a story behind that, which I won't bore you with to a company in uh, New York state. And they came up with a product called the OptiGrid, 
and that worked quite well. In parallel with this, Zeiss came out with a product they called the Apatome, which is exactly the same thing. Uh, we took the view Zeiss were being a bit n naughty in what they were up to, which is a view many people shared. Um, however, we took the practical view that we're getting all this free publicity for the technology from Zeiss, so why argue? <coughs> now, my prejudice comes to the fore, which is to say that um, you only use a computer when you've no choice. It's the, it's, the, it's the port of last resort. You don't use a computer if you can do things more elegantly, optically. So in Stoke, the idea is, how can you get r r rid of the fringes from this composite image optically? And for the electrical engineers, you do the spatial equivalent of lock-in demodulation. So you have a fringe pattern that you illuminate, and you have a fringe pattern in the detection plane. And in order to do the demodulation, you spin these things, you rotate them. And you time average, which in English means look with your eye at what you see. <laughs> and if you do that, again, uh, not going into too much detail, you can extract both the conventional image and the confocal image. Because it's important to get the conventional image as well. Because to paraphrase, I can't remember who, but I quite like it. What's the advantage of a confocal microscope? You only see the portion of the thick specimen that's in focus. What's the disadvantage of a confocal microscope? You only see the thin bit that's in focus. So you want to see the whole specimen to find the bit you're interested in. Then you want to switch to con confocal. This approach allows you to do both at the same time. In one part of the screen, you can have the conventional. The other part of the screen, you can have the confocal. The fact that everything is spinning and CCDs have improved tremendously, real-time imaging is easy. Even higher speed imaging is easy. If you have enough photons, it's easy. And by this technique, you can do confocal-like imaging, basically with a regular microscope. You could take the microscope, and maybe if we speak nicely to the Museum of the History of Science, we can take a hook-type microscope and turn it into a con a focal. We have the technology so to do. At that point we thought let's not sub-license this because we also thought actually pompously, arrogantly if you like, we can do better. So we decided to do it better by ourselves. Uh, this product became the Vivatome from Zeiss. We supplied it to Zeiss at that point it became, I can't remember what, from Andor. Um, we supplied to Andor. It's now in a more, in a improved state, if I can do the quick add, it's the Clarity from uh, Aurox, um, also av available as the sort of um, coffee machine, the espresso machine instrument as the uh, I can't remember my own product it's called, uh, as the Unity, thank you. Um, and also comes with our own fabulous um, software, imaginatively called Visionary, the whole thing being driven by a tablet. Anyway, that's it, enough of that. So I, I, interestingly, way back at the time of uh, the Aurox coming through uh, and before Zeiss taking it as a Vivitone, Actually, I was offered to beta test it for one of the other companies who was investigating it at the time. Yep. So you may not have even been aware of who they passed it to to beta test. Uh, so uh, when Perk and Elmer were interested at that time. Yeah, no, uh, I, so actually, I was months. aware of that. I, yeah. I was aware of that because although there are secrets, they are, they're not quite like Oxford for secrets. I mean, the, the okay, what's the... the what does the word strictly confidential mean? I, I don't know, no one's ever told me. Strictly confidential <laughs> means you only tell one person at a time. Very good, very well done. <laughs> so, uh, yes, there are confidentiality, but um, yeah. I, I've got a couple of quick questions just to end on. Okay. Firstly, 
Yeah. Actually, I'll go on. You're British. Where, where, where were you born? I was born in a place called Sutton in Ashfield, which is near Mansfield, which is in the Midlands, in Nottingham. It's on the Nottinghamshire Derbyshire border. So, and I stayed there until I was about Yorkshire, two. How come you were a Yorkshire cricket fan then? Ah, because at the age of two, my parents moved to Rotherham. Uh, and cricket was my father's great sport and my m m mother liked cricket also. She was born and lived in D Derbyshire and she would often take the bus to Nottingham and there would be a professional cricketer who would often take the bus with her. And at those times there was the, the, the amateurs and the prof professionals and this professional cricketer who she got to know a bit would go on the, the bus to Nottingham as it turned out to play for Nottinghamshire and he'll be wearing his cricket whites on the bus in order to go out and play and he was a chap called Harold Larwood. <laughs> okay just just this unknown cricketer. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed and, and then cricket was, 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 was what I played at school and um Family holidays always ended up in Scarborough for the Scarborough Cricket uh, Festival at the end of the summer, which was fantastic. So, so I've noticed you've actually kept your cowboy hat on for the entire interview and the chat. So uh, I, I kept my Yorkshire hat just for you, Tony. Well, so, yeah, but you you, mis you mispronounced it. You it's an inaspirate the H. I, I'm not a true Yorkshireman, Tony. I'm a brummie. Really? <laughs> Neither am I, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so, Neither am okay, I. two final questions. Yeah. Of all the publications that you've done and authored, oh, wow. which is your favourite one? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, they're all things that I'm proud of, otherwise I wouldn't have published them. Some, of course, one is more proud of than the others. I think one that I quite like, and it, it, it's it's not one the world will particularly have seen. It was written, it was, it was looking at the role of polarization in microscope imaging. Now, people often use polarization to do high angle vectorial theory of this, that, and the other. And to first order, and I don't wish to, I mean, I've done it as well. It doesn't tell you a great deal that it, if the microscope behaved dramatically different than you would pr predict from scalar th theory, you need to be a little bit careful. Now, of course, if it's a polarization effect you're looking at, then that's completely different. But I was always interested to, to wonder whether some of the things we saw in a polarization microscope were actually polarization effects in the sense of the specimen being birefringent or not, or, or what f physicists call um, form birefringence, i.e. scattering and the form of the material gives rise to a change in polarization. And one thing that we always look at is a point scatterer because you can look at resolution and this, that and the other. And there was one paper we did looking at, oh, oh we had also, of course, by that time realized that the confocal was the instrument of choice if you were doing polarization imaging, because one of the things you want in a polarization sensitive microscope is as high an extinction ratio as you can get. And for fundamental reasons in the conventional microscope, that extinction ratio cannot be zero. I, I won't bore yeah. you with why. Uh, in the con, it's broadly because you're it, you're averaging over intensity. In the confocal, where again hand waving, you're averaging over amplitude. You can get an infinite extinction ratio. So we were playing around with this and imaging point scatterers. Uh, looking at the polarization property between cross polars with cross circulars, this, that, and the other. And you get the most beautiful sh shapes of the image, spirals and goodness knows what, when you slightly defocus, yep. which you can't explain in any other way. 
And you see them when you're imaging biological tissue. You look at some of the images that, for example, Rudolf Oldenburg and Shinya Inoue were obtaining, and you can explain these things beautifully. Does the world care? Probably not. But it's beautiful. You can have the image and the theory. It's very, very simple. You do have to do the vectorial theory, but there's a point to doing the vectorial theory. It's just very, very pretty. I, I think there's I, actually polarization and light. I think there's a long way to go with that in how we oh, yes. it. Uh, Absolutely. I think that for the next 10, even yeah. 20 years, I think really starting to move into that area to gain well, information that we just can't see or capture at the moment. Yeah. And, and, and there's one other paper I wrote, which was also on polarization, where we actually built an electro optic de device which rotated the polarization and had uh, locking things. And you can basically map out the polarization states, the kind of thing Rudolf Oldenburg was, was up to. And you can do it in more or less real time. That was also a very pretty uh a paper i have to plug that one that was published in the journal of microscopy the other one i'm afraid was not <laughs> <laughs> no, a very old journal as well and still one of the best for microscopy itself that's so the one i think we're going to have to stop at this point i think we okay. could go on for another hour quite comfortably you have been brilliant thank you peter <laughs> and you wrecked my hair by the way putting that cap on i shouldn't have never well tried. i'll take my hat off because i actually had my hair cut yesterday in uh lockdown and i have to tell you it's the first time i've had my hair cut wearing a face mask that's m the main reason for wearing the hat at least you could get it cut oh, my, my son it, is still cutting my hair so it's, it's uh, I, I wasn't going to comment on that he, he is very good at it i've got to say <laughs> tony uh, you've been a star thank you very much thank i you. look forward to uh seeing more of your developments in the future thank okay you. peter thank you Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.